Hello, I'm Frank Epstein, founder and president of Collage New Music. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our latest online presentation entitled The Composer Speaks. The Composer Speaks is an opportunity to introduce composers directly to you. Our guest today is Peter Child, a longtime resident of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a faculty member at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Department of Music. Over the years, we've performed many of his chamber works, and he's a very capable composer, having written for large orchestra and huge choruses in music that is striking, intensely beautiful, and immensely powerful. Peter will be interviewed by music director David Hoos. We thank you all for joining us, and we hope this experience will bring you closer to new music and the composers who write it. The inevitable first question is, probably of everyone we're talking to, is what's it like composing in this day? It's very, it's very difficult. I actually completed a large piece, I think probably my largest chamber piece, in time for an April 4th, I think, was meant to be the premiere. And it was a struggle. I mean, it was a kind of a long time coming and it was, a, you know, I, I liked the piece. Um, and uh, I really worked very hard to make sure I met that deadline. And shortly after I completed the piece and submitted it, the concert was cancelled. And... Um, what is that piece? It's a piece that I... Uh, it's called Six Dances of Death. Coincidentally, I feel like there's a, something prophetic about this piece, actually, um, because it's it's it has two principal sources. One is the um, series of woodcuts by the artist, the Renaissance artist Holbein the Younger, called The Dance of Death. Um, uh, and the other source is the music of Henry VIII. Yeah. Um, and I sort of as this piece evolved in my imagination, it kind of stemmed from a kind of uh, sense of some parallelisms between the court of Henry VIII, his, what it, his reputed, you know, extreme narcissism and megalomania, and some of our own, you know, uh, the political climate that we're living in now here in America. And so that's what led me to want to explore this as a topic. And I did a lot of research, you know, preparing for the, for the piece. But then as the piece evolved, the, the interaction between the musical sources from Henry VIII and the visual sources from Holbein became more prominent. And it was much more about these, these, these woodcuts, which are ex extremely dramatic and effective and sometimes very satirical, death as a sort of cavorting skeleton, skeletal figure, is present in all of the tableaus. Um, and sometimes, you know, if, if the person being escorted to, to their death by this figure is a potentate, either a political or a religious potentate, the, um, the feeling around the, the picture is quite satirical. But not always, you know, sometimes the, the, the victim or the chosen one is, uh, is an innocent, like a child or an old person or a poor person, and there's, there's, there's pathos there too. So I've kept very involved in, very sort of deeply immersed in these woodcuts, and, and also I, you know, re really learned, I studied these extant pieces by Henry VIII, there were about 33 of these pieces that exist and really learned them and sort of selected the ones I wanted to use. And, um, and that was the piece. You know, there was a lot of research, the composition, you know, there was a lot of work <laughs> involved. And I struggled to meet the deadline and I met the deadline and then the piece was cancelled. And then after that, um, I haven't really been composing. 
Let me ask you a question about the chamber piece you just finished. Mm -hmm. um, were you asked to write this piece um, focused on the on the issues that you ended up writing about, or did were you just asked to write a piece and then consequently yeah, you thought about a source of inspiration? Yeah, it it was the latter. I can't go. I can't remember far enough back because it's it's going back quite a while. I mean, this time last year, I was I was studying these. Henry VIII scores and reading literature and, you know, in that research um, phase of the piece. So the, the very beginning, sort of the embryonic idea, I can't remember exactly how that happened, but, I, but it, it is the case, and this is something that you know, because you know me well, and you know my music well, um, that you actually already know about me, is that it is quite common for me maybe even necessary for me to connect in my artistic work to what I'm experiencing in the world around me or in my personal life. How often do you end up composing music without a performance in mind, just for your own edification? I, I honestly can't remember the last time I composed a, a piece, certainly a, a sub, you know, substantial piece that wasn't with a particular performer and an eventual performance already sort of in mind. So um, I sometimes think that that would be, I'm attracted to the idea in principle, but in practice, being able to imagine the, the players that I'm going to be working with or the singers, you know, the musicians that I'm going to be working with is part of the process for me, I think. But who knows, that might have to so, change. So when you get <clears throat> started writing a, a piece for instance this chamber piece do you ever get stuck unable to figure out what to do oh, yeah. and what do you do when you get stuck because it's hard to imagine yeah anyone doesn't get stuck right so no the beginnings of pieces especially begin especially big pieces can can feel quite i, I can feel quite forlorn actually and hopeless particularly if the generative idea isn't there. If I know that, um, you know, it, 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 the commission is there, a deadline is there, you know, the, the, the necessity to write the piece is there, but the, the artistic, um, embryonic idea isn't there, then that, that I can feel, you know, I, it, it can feel quite desperate. The, the, the odd thing about that is that it, some... Uh, degree of desperation happens almost every time. Oh my God, I'm never going to be able to put, put pen to, I'm never going to write another piece, that's it, I'm done. Um, uh, so evidently that's also part of the process. If I take a, if I step back far enough and, uh, and think about that and realize actually, you know, it's, it's a part, you know, it's a moment and I get over that moment and, uh, and, and get going again. To some degree, well, to some degree, I, I, I have found that, uh, you know, I, I, I have to trick myself. I think part of the problem is, and, it, you know, it depends on the scale of the piece. Uh, so the problem, the, the problem is, is often if it's a big piece, smaller pieces are less troubling from this, in this way. But if it's a big piece, it's that sense of wanting to be able to imagine the whole and knowing that the whole is so far away, there's so much work, you know, there's so, there's so much distance, that there's so much about the piece, what the piece will eventually be that I not only don't know, but cannot possibly know in advance, that um, it's just so overwhelmingly daunting. And that's the thing I have to sort of escape from, sort of protect myself from that feeling of feeling overwhelmed. So the tricks, so the tricks I play mostly are mind games, you know, do a little quote, okay. I don't have to solve these big problems. All I have to do is work for 30 minutes and I'll show you something. I'm going to just get off camera for a second. This is something that my wife bought for me. It's, a, it's an egg timer or a, it's a timer. And it's, it's 30 minutes from beginning to end. It was actually kind of typical of her that she kind of, she knows me well enough to know how much use I would get out of this. And if I have a task that's daunting and, and overwhelming and it's just so, that's just, 
I, I can't see myself from beginning to end. I said, well, actually, all I have to do is turn this over and work for the, and, and, and work until that's done, or do my best to work until that's done, and then I can do something else. And it's a, my, it's a trick. Um, and almost, and it just relieves me from that pressure and, and enables me to work. And almost always, by the time this runs out, I want to keep, keep going. Do you find yourself sketching things and throwing most of them away? Or, are, or do you actually not commit to anything on the page and then suddenly you're, and then you find yourself able to move now? And you don't back up. No, it varies. It, it absolutely, it very rarely back up, very rarely throw anything out. I might have an idea that, uh, that gets, uh, you know, tabled and I don't find a place for it right away. But I rarely throw anything out. But sketching is very important to me. And, um, you know, just, just an idea that, you know, that might be a sort of an sort of an imagined figure um it might be a, an improvised figure that i write down that i think yes okay that's that's something do you find uh, th do you find those ideas that you can't find a place for right now not even finding a place in this piece but some later time in some other piece there yeah. is an idea that you had yeah, a absolutely. year ago Yes. Yeah. I have come across old sketches that I forgot that I'd ever made that have, you know, found a place and actually helped me and saved me in some situations. That yeah. end up being fertile. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But sketching, that's right. I mean, that's also a, it's not, you know, that's also important because a sketch is only a sketch. It's not, a, there's no commitment there. Just an idea. And, um, and I think the other thing with me is I think the process, the compositional process at every level is a slow one. You know, some people are very fast and I, I, I certainly envy them their speed, you know. But for me, the process is a very slow one. So, and, so I might have an idea, write down the idea. And usually that, I think there's something even in the sort of um, the graphic, you know, the way the idea is written down that emblematizes its provisional nature because it's almost always almost illegible right so it, so a, to, a kind of sh a shape or a gesture yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Or, 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 just or just something, something that's, that's written, written so, so um the word is sketchily you know so so with so little detail sort of just hinting at what the actual idea is that if i'm not careful if i leave it too long i i it's quite hard to decode sometimes afterwards. And I think there's something deliberate about that. That's, a, that's another part of the mind game. I'm sorry, I'm not really committing to this, just writing this idea down. But, it, but part of the slowness, I think, is figuring out what the possibilities of my ideas actually are. So sleeping on, you know, doing the composition is important, but actually being away from the, being away from the music and letting, I think it's letting my unconscious mind work on it is very much an important part of the process for me. How yeah, often so do you find, once, once it's past a sketch stage and it's actually on the staff paper and there are pitches and rhythms, mm -hmm. how often do you find yourself making changes, wholesale changes, and how often do you find yourself making little changes, which might be very important, changing that G sharp to a, a B natural? or that rhythm, rhythmic gesture, tightening it or freeing it up. Do those kinds of changes take place? Yes, I think that happens all the time. I mean, I don't kind of keep a mental record of it, but I think it happens all the time. And a lot of it happens, of course, in the rehearsal process as well. You know, you discover, th discover and of course, it depends who you're rehearsing with. I mean, uh, one of the things that I appreciate greatly and have over what is now decades of professional association with you you know, is that is this kind is that I feel that our process is very much a, a collaborative process. And I've often found your suggestions, which are often rather concrete, <laughs> to be very helpful. Well, that's very nice. You know? But I don't, I hope I don't say, well, I, I think that G should be a G sharp, uh, or seldom, I hope. Um, I, I would have to really think if anything quite like that has ever happened. But, you know, we've, we've, 
you have certainly made suggestions uh, about orchestration that I've taken on board and incorporated and things like that and learned a lot from. And by the way, I, I convey to my students, um, I mean, I, I think our relationship is a bit special in that way. I don't think that's true of my interaction with all the performers that I like to work with. But um, but I do convey a sort of a, as a life lesson to, to my composition students that a piece of music is not completed until it's been performed. And, and what I mean by that is you need to hear it. You need to... You, you need to hear it, but you also need to experience the music that you wrote that and, uh, as a kind of an interactive medium with the players and what they're giving back to. You know, you need to learn about the piece from what the players do with it. Peter, your wife, Lena, is a very distinguished visual artist. Um, I, I don't think of your, your music and her visual art as very similar. She's more of a conceptual artist. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if you see connections between your music and her, her uh, pieces or something similar about your working styles or even different that would be of interest to us? Well, the working styles, I think, probably are different in one very significant way that they're different is, has to do with your last question. I mean, she will work in intense spurts for a particular show and then put it all aside, you know, until the next intense spurt happens or the next deadline. Um, uh, her artistic sensibility and especially her education and goal, goals artistically, are different from mine. They're radically different from what mine used to be. But of course, you know, in the 10 years since she and I have been together, I've been really kind of intellectually and artistically in terms of artistic sensibility kind of rubbing shoulders with her trying to you know trying to understand her work um, and being brought back in touch with a um, some impulses some artistic and intellectual impulses that for me were kind of part of my history part of who I am but were very much dormant you know because as a student I was interested in what basically the musical equivalent of conceptual art, which is cage and aleatoric music and, and things of that kind. And um, so interacting with Lena around subjects of art has sort of reinvigorated some of those early interests and enthusiasms of mine, reignited them as well. And, um, and actually it's... it's given me kind of a, a shot in the arm. It's kind of broadened what I, what I try to do musically. And, uh, you know, a big impetus for that is that I do a lot, I almost always do something in connection with her shows. You know, if she has a, um, an opening and if there's an opportunity for me to, to, to do a piece, um, either for a performer or more typically for myself to perform, then I'll do it. And that's led me to do all sorts of things that are, that are really, you know, musically, you know, have added to, uh, you know, the, the, the range of possibilities that, you know, I see in my music. It's really had a kind of a profound effect. So I've done electronic pieces. I've done pieces that involve electronics and, and narration that I've performed at her openings. I've done a piece for prepared piano that um, that I performed at the piano as an accompaniment to Lena reading some of her texts. You know, things that I are unlike anything I have done in all, again, all the years, the decades since you and I have known one another since graduate school in Brandeis, you know, really connecting to something that was 
part of me before that time. So it's actually been, in terms of both what I do creatively and how I think about music and art, it's been an expand, a process of, of expansion and um, I think rejuvenation, you know, for me. Are, are some of those um, characteristics that you find in your music or that emerge in your music when you're writing a piece for one of Lena's shows, uh, do they begin to show up in your concert music? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I did a piece a few years ago, um, a, a recorded piece that took just a simple line of text and I subjected it to a the simple line of text. I recorded it myself, my own voice sort of with this one line of text and then basically subjected that recording to increasingly dense layers of um, of interference, you know, an expansion, until eventually it was, the, the words were indistingu in, indistinguishable as words, and it was just uh, with just sort of sounds, electronic sounds in the end. And when I got done, I, when I, so the performance of that piece was just a matter of pressing the start button on a, on a recording device. But uh, when I got done, another artist, friend of Lena's, and somebody who had become, I'd become very friendly with, and who was himself also a conceptual artist, came up to me and he said something that actually made, a, made me really think about what I had done, not just in that piece, but what I had been doing in other pieces prior to that one, and what subsequently became a sense of, of, my, uh, of what I think of as my process and my style. And he said, he said, he said the piece is like a mantra. He didn't say very much about it. You didn't, didn't elaborate on, on it very much, but, and, you know, he, he made this remark and I thought about it and I thought, first of all, that's a kind of a very positive way to describe this otherwise rather repetitive, you know, cyclical form. Um, but that, I, 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 you know, I, I realized that actually in, a, in quite a lot of music that I'd written prior to that piece or to the experience or, or prior to you know, Lena's influence, had that form. It was, it, it was the form of musical ideas, stretches of ideas that at one level appeared to be repeating, that were cyclical, but were never exactly the same from one iteration to the next. I'd already been doing it. It shows up in that uh, orchestral piece, Shanti, that I wrote, and some um, uh, a piece called Meditations Upon the Lamb, which is a choral piece, actually, but, uh, and it's called Meditations Upon the Lamb because it incorporates texts about the Lamb. And I then subsequently I took that on board as a kind of, I said, yes, I'm doing this already. And that, yes, this is something I, I think is a stamp uh, and, and kind of an interesting way to, I, sort of an interesting formal notion for me to pursue. And so quite a lot of my pieces are like that now. Some movements in Lamentations, the piece, the last piece that I wrote for the Cantata Singers, are like that. Elegy, the elegy with Rabbit that you alluded to earlier, the collage performed, is very much like that. You know, the idea that the idea that things cycles are repeating, and you sort of listen and you think, actually, I'm hearing the cyclicity, and yet never things are never exactly the same. And I like the idea of taking that notion and stretching it out, but also stretching it to danger point. You know, um, you know, taking it just about as far as you can, I, you can take it um, without losing your audience, and then releasing. So let me ask one more question, and then we should let you go. Um, I, you said that this particular time that we're in has is proving difficult for you to yeah. compose. Um, partly because you finished a large piece and maybe there's not something, you know, pushing on you to write the next piece. Um, but do you have something that you are conjuring up? Yeah, so I, I'm just going to get off screen for a second because I, I actually, through a, a colleague who's a medievalist, I discovered... Um, a early Renaissance hymn that's a response to the plague. Well, actually, the, 
not the series of plagues, you know, after the Black Death that visited themselves upon Europe. And it's the text is Stella Celi Extiapavit. And there are several settings uh, of this um, music in existence, um, some chant settings and some po uh, polyphonic settings. But it's one of the few pieces that was where the text was composed, you know, appealing actually to, to, met, to the Virgin Mary to intercede on behalf of the sick and intercede with the constellations that are visiting these terrible, you know, diseases upon us all. Um, and, and was, uh, and the hymn was apparently used in services that, you know, well, that, were, that addressed these troubles. And uh, you know, to the to the medieval people in the Middle Ages and the uh, early Renaissance period who were visited by these plagues, it must have felt. You can't imagine, but it didn't feel something like what we're feeling now. The, the known world was visited by, the, by, by this invisible, uh, you know, inscrutable phenomenon that could rob you, not just you of your life, but you rob you of your loved ones almost overnight. You know, it was a very swift, uh, the plague was a very swift disease. So I'm, what's cooking, but I had to reach over and get this off my, um, my music stand is an idea of somehow incorporating this text or, po or possibly, as I did with the Henry the Eighth piece, incorporating some of the existing settings uh, of that text as source materials of a new piece, either, either a vocal piece or possibly even an, instru an instrumental piece. But yeah, but the, it's, it's just another example of how, for me, what's going on in my personal life and in the world around me is such an important part of what I, of what informs what I want to do as a composer. Well, if the topic of, or the focus of this uh, possible composition that you will maybe working on in the next months is not the most optimistic one, it is a wonderful thing that you are thinking about writing music because you oh, are a very is. special composer. And uh, I personally, and I think many, many people will look forward to hearing not only the piece that you have just recently completed, but also the one that you are about to write. Peter, thank you thank so you, much for this time, your eloquence and your thoughts about thank you, the world of composition. We're grateful. I enjoyed it. It's always wonderful to see you and talk to you. Likewise. Peter wrote his elegy for an ensemble of flute, clarinet, violin, cello, piano, percussion, um, shortly after his father passed away and after a period that Peter um, had said was a fallow period. His father had been quite ill and he was taking care of him and this piece was both his coming back out into the world of composition after a quiet period and also a response to his father's passing away. It's a very beautiful piece. It's a direct in its language and quite eloquent and touching. <laughs>